Trinitarian God. We thank you for this wonderful gift of Trinity to all of us. Through this Trinitarian mystery, you reveal a love that is endless, unconditional, and ever flowing. May this Trinitarian love instill in each of us the same love to share with one another in our families, in our communities, in the society, and in this time where people need help. And very especially as we enter into a special session of listening on this theme of the Blessed Trinity, we invite you to pour upon all of us the Spirit of God, very especially on Dr. Father Victor Edwin, who will be enlightening us this evening. Bless all of us, our relatives, and very especially this moment. Make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome, my dear sisters and brothers. Thank you, Father. Wonderful. It is always a joy to see so many of you. And with that same spirit of joy and openness, I invite today's speaker, our beloved uh, Dr. Father Victor Edwin S.J., who is currently teaching in Vidya Jyoti. Uh, he's a professor of theology here. Uh, and he's also a well-known expert in uh, interreligious dialogue, Christian-Muslim dialogue, etc. But today he is going to focus on the theme, the Blessed Trinity. Let us listen to him. He already suggested to me that we could keep the Bible close by and when needed, please take notes. And you also know at the end of it, I will be sending the recorded version later. So welcome to all of you and very especially warm welcome to Father Victor Edwin. Father Victor Edwin, over to you. Father Victor Edwin, you need to unmute yourself. Good and afternoon. You... Good afternoon to you. Do you hear me now? Yes, yes. Welcome. Father. Yes, yes. 
Welcome, Father. Thank you, Father Rajkumar. Thank you, fathers, uh, for brothers and sisters. Good afternoon to everyone. Today we shall uh, contemplate upon journey into, as Father Rajkumar put, the gift of our faith, our Trinitarian faith. Uh, dear sisters and brothers, I will be speaking slowly. Uh, whenever you need to make a notes, you could make, and I would say certain references, which you kindly note down so that you can reflect back. Every Christian, in his own or her own personal prayer, or liturgical prayer, we begin with the invocation of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So every prayer begins with that. That itself shows that at the heart of our faith in God, our faith is Trinitarian. One God we believe in. We believe that one God is three co-eternal persons. Three divine persons in one God. One God as three divine persons, as we say. When we express this faith, many questions may come in our heart. All people of other faiths who live with us, they may ask about our faith. First question could be, how do we know this? This one God is three co-eternal persons or three divine persons, Father, Son, Spirit. How do we know? Sometimes maybe people may ask, yes, you, we believe in one God. Why should make a difference whether this one God is three persons or... Uh, so why do we need to ask this? Uh, why do we need to express that very specifically one God in three eternal persons, co-eternal persons? And some may seem to dismiss simply it is a mystery. Why should we bother about a mystery? Yes, it's mystery for us and God has revealed to us, fine. But why should we bother? Mystery, let it be a mystery. Let's get along with our life. We say that we want to believe in one God. Yes, Trinity is a mystery. But God has revealed that mystery to us. That means God wants us to do something about it. God wants that our life be founded upon the Trinitarian life of God. God has revealed it so that we shape our life and found our life on that Trinitarian life. Our faith in one God must nourish our life. We should make this faith as the well-being of our life. We do it through the sacraments, through the prayers. So the richness of God's inner life nourish our life from deep within and make us to found ourselves on God, the Trinitarian God, and to experience divine life that the Father gives in Christ, in the Holy Spirit. So this faith nourishes our life. So we need to contemplate, we need to uh, learn, deepen our faith by understanding. So we said um, uh, to, to this God is one God and God revealed it. And we must, we could ask, where does God reveal? To a mystic, to a sadhu, saint, saints of the church, or in a philosophical speculation? must say that God has revealed it in the salvation history of human person. So the first key sentence for the whole faith expression is God revealed God's self as Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian God in the salvation history of human person. 
So this revelation is not an additional information about God, but it is revealed in the salvation history of human person. So we must hold revelation and salvation together. It is like two sides of the same coin. God reveals God's inner life in the salvation history of the human person. That is very key. That is at the, it's like an axis around which we understand. So when we say God reveals God's self in the salvation, salvation history, that means first and foremost, we need to look at the scriptures for the data. Salvation history is recorded in the Bible. So we need to look at the Bible uh, for the data because this faith is not a philosophical uh, speculation of some mystics, but it is rooted in the scripture. We need to approach the scripture with humility. St. Paul beautifully says this, uh, we are given this faith, not because of, you know, we understand it well and we are capable of um, uh, comprehending faith. No, not at all. God reveals us, gives us a gift. So we hold this truth in the earthen treasures. This uh, treasure is the earthen vessels. So with humility, we need to approach this. So we go to the uh, Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God reveals God's self, not as an abstract power, many symbols but the main metaphor God reveals is God is the father not an abstract power God is the father when we hear God is the father oftentimes we might think it's more of physical sense it is not in the physical sense neither in the physical sense nor as a patriarchal male Father Rajkumar, someone says that uh, I'm not, I'm not audible. Do all of them hear, I suppose? Yeah. Do you all hear? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Okay. Okay. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, yes, Father. Okay. May, I, may I suggest instead of sending any messages via the group chat, you message Father Rajkumar or me privately if there's anything. Otherwise, it disturbs the speaker in between. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Father Victor Edwin, go ahead. Yes. All the others. Uh, God as a father. Hosea, write down. Hosea chapter 11, verse 9. I am not man. I am God, the holy other. Father, the metaphor is not a human being God, but the holy other. So when we talk about metaphor, Father, it's... it's um, it's, it gives some crucial information about who God is. It generates a new perspectives about God. You see, you know, simile and metaphor, a simile is something which compares one aspect of one thing with the other. Like you find a man or a woman, a brave person, you can say that he is brave like a lion or she is brave like a lioness that's simile but metaphor is much beyond that it contemplates the reality truth contemplates the reality for an example you say this um Tao. Uh, when you talk about peace Tao is a beautiful symbol it generates uh, it somehow contemplates truth or peace so, Father, the metaphor image, contemplates the mercy of God towards humanity, the intimate bond between the creator and the creation. So, this is a Father image. This Father image also does not mean it's like a patriarch, male power, but the scripture says, please note down, Isaiah 66 
verse 30, 13, this father has maternal feeling, Raham. Raham is the Umish love. How the mother cares for the child in the womb, father cares for you. A creator cares for us. So this father is not a male matriarchal power figure, but one who cares for humanity as a mother. So the content of this revelation as father is to reveal the intimate bond between father as creator and human beings, man and woman as sons and daughters. Look at um, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 6. So, Father, I established you. I formed you. So that intimate bond is not just created like, uh, a, you know, like the, um, the product chain in a factory. One after the other car, one after the other cars are being produced. God didn't produce. With a greater uh, intimacy. God creates us, formed you in the womb of your mother, established you. And also again in Deuteronomy 32, 18, we would see God giving birth. Once again, it is not of, a, uh, not to connote any sexual activity, but simply a historical divine choice. God chose us. So in the, the content of God as the father for humanity is God's unconditional love for them, for us. And God is faithful to this intimate bond that he has created. The intimate bond that he has established. And this father also demands, demands each one of us to be faithful, to respond to his love, to respond to his unconditional love. We, he calls for the, God calls for the fidelity to the demands of our relationships. Faithful to God and to our brothers and sisters. So the Old Testament Jewish scripture says, flirting with other gods, taking something else for God, is the way people deny their true patronage. By rejecting God, we behave like un, ungrateful children. So this father figure uh, continues to be revealed in the prophetic literature. The father follows the people with love and fidelity. And father demands, I call you my children. You call, you, uh, you call, you, you call me as your father. So behave accordingly. In Malachi chapter 1, 16, we hear father is the master and human person must serve him. Human person must listen to him in fidelity or serve. And dear brothers and sisters, this uh, continues in the deuterocanonical books. You know that deuterocanonical books are those books which is accepted in the canon by the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church and Oriental Orthodox Churches and Assyrian Church of the East. So these churches accept these books, so it's like Tobit. And the Protestant churches do not accept them part of their canon. So in, the, in these books also it continues. In Tobit, chapter 13, verse 4. God, our Father, He has in fidelity and love, He is our, our companion. He, he demands steadfast commitment to this Father. So, dear brothers and sisters, so what we have uh, talked about is very brightly, along with my other images like God as King, God light, with all other images. God as father metaphor is coming very brightly in the Jewish Testament. We have also certain concepts, categories that dimly reflect the richness of the 
interior life of God. That's very important because these categories later in the light of the death and resurrection of the Lord, the evangelists, the Bible writers would connect with them and see that this, what the Old Testament talks about these categories. I will be telling what are those categories. They are dimly revealed that they are the Son and Holy Spirit. So we look at those categories and see how they, the number three of them, but I, we shall con, uh, concentrate on one of the categories. Wisdom, word, and spirit. So wisdom is an important category. So we give attention to wisdom. Wisdom is discussed in a number of books, like Job, Proverb, Sirach, and Wisdom. The first and foremost point about wisdom is, wisdom is beyond human reach. By one's own effort, people cannot reach wisdom. We cannot get wisdom. It is simply a divine gift. God gives it unconditionally. We cannot demand this from God. So this wisdom category, wisdom is talked about in the, the book of Job. And this wisdom is also present when God created the world. So the wisdom is related to the works of creation, related to God, exists, they cooperated with God, and related to God, and related to the creation. So that's how the wisdom is begin to be reflected in this book. Then we move into the book of Proverbs. Here, little more is revealed about the wisdom. Wisdom is like a prophet. Prophet is one who speaks in the name of God. So similarly, wisdom preaches her mission. Prophets are sent by God to preach God's word to people, to challenge them. Similarly, wisdom is preaching his, her mission. Wisdom is uh, no, it's, uh, seen as the feminine uh, quality. Wisdom preaches her mission. What is that preaching is all about? Just two things. Obey God's law, you will have life. If you do disobey God's law, you will be, um, you will, you will, you will, you will lead, it will lead you to disaster. Obedience will lead one to have life in abundance. Disobedience will lead one to disaster. This is a, a preaching of wisdom. And uh, the proverb says that listening to this wisdom will give salvation. So you see, in the book of Job, wisdom is connected with creation. When God created, God, the wisdom was there in creation and related with creator and related with creation. And here you see, the wisdom that is present in creation is also present in salvation. So wisdom's presence, it is created, along with God cooperated and also present in, in the salvation of human person. Then it moves in the book of Sirach. This wisdom is of divine origin. And this wisdom existed for all ages. And this wisdom, now something more is revealed about this wisdom. This wisdom follows the creator, this father, and makes her home among the people of Jerusalem. And she pits, pitches her tent in Jerusalem and invites people for a banquet. In the banquet, she herself becomes food to nourish the life of people who listen to her. This 
this idea that is being revealed uh, in the book of Sirach is taken up by the evangel evangelists to say that this wisdom is Jesus. So Jesus is the wisdom of God. You see, what is dimly revealed in the Old Testament is being brought into new light in the death and resurrection of our Lord. Okay. Then it continues, uh, Book of Wisdom uh, talks about, especially chapter 10, human beings are saved by Sophia, Sophia, the wisdom, the wisdom of God. So we see that being uh, uh, reflected uh, by St. Uh, Saint Paul uh, in the first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, Jesus Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, who was present, creation and renewal, that's Paschal mystery. And once again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 to chapter 2, 8, this uh, mysterious inaccessibility that we talked about wisdom in the beginning, Paul says, only those who are enabled by the divine will recognize Jesus as the power and wisdom of God. So, and recognizing Jesus as the power and wisdom of God is not a human achievement, but it is divine gift. So, uh, dear brothers and sisters, we have looked into, summarizing, we have looked into the Old Testament, what is being revealed. Is revealed Father God, God is our merciful Father who cares for us, who is tenderly loving towards creation. And the categories like wisdom, word, and spirit, we concentrated on wisdom. This wisdom of God is with God in creation, it cooperated in, in, in wisdom. Humanity is saved, creation and uh, salvation are brought together by wisdom. Okay. Now, we move into New Testament. The New Testament, once again, Father is revealed. We should carefully uh, point, uh, recognize this Father who is revealed in, uh, in the New Testament is first, in the first uh, category, this father is the one God of the Jewish faith. It's not somebody new. What the New Testament talk about God as father, the same God as father is being revealed in the New Testament. One God of the Jewish faith is revealed as father in the New Testament too. Now you want, one might ask a question. What is something about New Testament? Is it simply affirming what the Old Testament says? That's all New Testament. Is there anything new in it? Because when we say uh, the New Testament affirms the father of Old Testament, that is the one God of the Jewish faith is the father of the New Testament. So is that all uh, being revealed? Yes. What is new is the question has to be dealt with. This father is first and foremost fundamentally, primarily, Father of Jesus Christ. That is the newness of the, uh, the revelation in the New Testament. First and fundamentally, Father of Jesus Christ. In the first aspect of God, the one Father, one God of Jewish faith, we look at, um, uh, you could kindly note down, Matthew chapter 6, 26, Luke chapter 10, 2, the first aspect, no God as a creator, savior, unique and personal God, immortal God, provider, no, providing God, all those images are there. So first category. But the second, second aspect is very important. This father is primarily, repeating it, primarily and fundamentally father of Jesus Christ. So this father is not only uh, in general, beneficial to all creation, but 
He has a unique relationship with Jesus, unique relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. So the key word here is relationship. Very important. Father, father of Jesus Christ. He, there is a unique relationship is there between father and Jesus Christ. So this unique relationship is made clear uh, in, the, or in, the, in, the, in the New Testament. One could ask, this father is the father of Jesus Christ and father of all, so all the disciples for us. Is there a qualitative difference? Yes, there is a qualitative difference between God, father of Jesus Christ and God, the father of, of uh, the disciples. You look at uh, chapter 11 of Matthew 27. The Lord says, all things are delivered to me. He didn't say all things are delivered to all the whole, um, you know, who has uh, um, the, the, the disciples, the apostles. God has not revealed everything to uh, the way he has revealed to Jesus. There is a qualitative difference. All things are delivered to me. Look at chapter 10 of the Luke, uh, verse 22. Setting something similar. The qualitative difference is there. We need to clarify that. So we talked about the unique relationship and qualitatively different. This unique relationship is qualitatively different in term with, the, with regard to Jesus Christ, God's son. Mark the word unique relationship. That's very important. So this unique relationship is of twofold. That's what revealed in the New Testament. In the first uh, fold, Jesus Christ relates all things to the Father. You look at Mark chapter 14, verse 36. He prays to the Father. Mark 13, so verse 32. He says, uh, the knowledge of the parousia about Father. So he relates everything to the Father. So these Thai verses, sometimes people ask, people may ask you that, uh, oh, now Jesus is praying to the Father. How they are three co-eternal persons. So we have to say, dear friends, this is the first fold, first level. We need to go deeper into the second level. This is a faith. The second level, Jesus is playing from the, in the front foot, no, as the cricket language for playing front foot. Jesus is doing everything with the freedom and sovereignty. Though Jesus relates all things to the Father, second level in the second hand, on the say, other hand, second level, deeper level, Jesus does everything with the freedom and sovereignty. He teaches with authority. Mark Chapter 1, verses 2. He was not teaching like the Pharisees and Sadducees. He preaches with authority. And he's the master of Sabbath. Mark, chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. He is greater than the temple. Chapter Ma Matthew, chapter 12, verse 6. Jesus forgives the sins. Only God alone can forgive sin. And Jesus forgives. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. When Jesus is forgiving, power goes forth from. Very special. Mark chapter 5, 13. And Jesus knows the Father. Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. So, Though Jesus relates all things with uh, all things to the Father, the unique relationship is expressed by teaching with authority, forgiving sins, by knowing the Father intimately. Yes, dear friends, we continue with the unique unique relationship is a key word in this uh, whole uh, uh, revelation revelation part. 
We said the key, the unique relation is of a twofold in which Jesus establishes authority. And we can ask, what is the content of the unique relationship? Yes, Jesus is doing this. One what basis and what is the content of that unique relationship? How do we understand that? We understand that in Sorry, we understand that in terms of recognizing the exclusive origin and the close intimacy, Jesus' exclusive origin from the Father and the close intimacy with the Father. And this is ex it is expressed in Father sending the Son. Father sends the Son. Son is sent by the Father. So there is an intimacy there. Once again, here a question may come. The prophets also were sent by God. So how Jesus is different from the prophets? Is Jesus simply a prophet? Came to, you know, to, to remind what was uh, said in the Old Testament. Love God, love neighbor. This is the teaching of the Old Testament. Is he coming to simply to remind people of that? Second level, he is not simply a representative of God, goes beyond representation. So the key word here, this unique relationship is expressed in reciprocity. He is not in the a rep simple representing God. There is a reciprocity between, in the, between father and the son. The reciprocity of faith. If one has faith in Jesus, he has faith in God. One who has faith in God, Father is expressing his faith or faith in Jesus. So the intrinsic connection between the reciprocate, recipro, reciprocity of faith. Unique relationship, reciprocity, faith in the level of faith. And this reciprocity has four dimension that helps us to understand what this reciprocity means. It's reciprocal knowledge and love. Note down Matthew chapter 27 and Luke chapter 10, sorry, Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, and Luke chapter 10, verse 22. So Jesus is the revealer of the Father. See the reciprocity in faith. He's not only simply representing the uh, Father, representing God as prophets, but he reveals the Father. That comes very clearly in John 10, 15. As Father knows, and I know Father. So he reveals the Father to us. He reveals, he gives the knowledge of the Father. And it's not only simply knowledge, but also this knowledge implies mutual love. Go to John, the third chapter, verse 35, the father loves the son, given all things into his hands. You see, the mutual knowledge is really mutual love. God has given all things into his hand. Go to John chapter 5, 20. Father loves the son, shows all that he himself to him. So the intimacy, prosity. Okay. And uh, so. Yes. So we continue. This uh, revelation is, um, uh, we said the mutual, uh, the knowledge of God, knowledge of the Father, and also the mutual love uh, between the Father. And Son reveals the Father, not just merely represents Him, He reveals the Father, the in-depth, so He revealing Father to us. And the second dimension of this reciprocity is, uh, it's characterized by the unity of action and power. Father and Son works together. Jesus accomplishes 
the work of the Father. Kindly take John 10, verse 37. Raises the dead. John 5, uh, John for chapter 5, 21. Jesus can give eternal life. John 10, 28 verses. Uh, verse 28. John chapter 10, verse 28. He gives eternal life. How could uh, Jesus give eternal life? Because he has life in himself. Father's life in himself. So John 5, verse 26. So he exercises the judgment once again. John 5, verse 22. So the work of the Father and the work of the Son are the same. So unity of action. God and Son, Father and Son work together. It comes very beautifully in St. Paul in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the tri-personal God is engaging with sin and our, uh, against a uh, tri-personal God engages with the sin for our deliverance. So the tri-personal Father, Son together working. So the unity of action, the unit, mutual love leading to unity of action that leads to mutual interiority. Friends, these are all important key words to show the depth of uh, Jesus revealing the Father. So, Father is in me and I am in the Father. John chapter 10, verse 38. So, uh, then now uh, we are moving to the third dimension, the dimension of a relationship, reciprocity. From that, we come to mutual knowledge. It goes into mutual love and it falls into unified action and then mutual interiority. Father in me and Father in I am in the Father. From there, it goes to the immanence. Father in Jesus, Father in the Lord, the Son and Son in the Father. The immanence. Later, theologians you use the word perichoresis. No, we don't uh, bother about the word perichoresis, but immanence. So, brothers and sisters, the key words, relationship, reciprocity, mutual knowledge, mutual love, unified action, mutual interiority, and immanence. Father and Son. Father and Son, so we recognize Father and Son, one single reality. Please note down and underline it. One single reality with mutual distinction. Father, Son in one another. Okay, the last dimension we will stop there it's because 15. Our father told me to stop at 40 minutes uh, so that if in case any questions. Okay, the final dimension is, the fourth dimension is action and identity. The mutual love, identity working together, and then finally it uh, into, into one, the immanence, the perichoresis, and oneness. This one reality and distinct persons, father and son. John chapter 10, verse 13. I and father are one. So here, the salvific power of Jesus Christ is not only similar to the Father, but it is the salvific power of himself. So the unity is not something closed uh, within uh, God's self. The unity between Father and Son is not closed simply, which is not, uh, not revealed, but this unity is communicative. That's why we said God reveals God's self as father and son and spirit in the salvation history of. So this mutual love between father and son, the one single reality with, uh, as two distinct persons is not only within oneself, but also communicating. Uh, they may be one. That's very important for the friends. How it is communicative? Very important words. 
John 17, 21. That they may be one as we are one, even as we are one, even as we are one. So this oneness, this one single reality, Father, Son, two distinct person is not within, it is communicated. And so the, the, the John's gospel beautifully says, as we are one, them may be one. So it is an invitation for us to enter into the intimacy of this. That's why I said in the beginning, we nourish our life with on this foundation through our prayer, personal prayer, liturgy. How do we nourish ourselves? It's John 17, 21. By being in mutual uh, love for one another, we, are, we experience our true existence in God, to you God. Holy Spirit will come in the Pentecost. Here we stop for a moment. Father Raj. Wonderful. Father Edwin, that was wonderful. Now, anybody wants to ask any clarifications or raise questions, you're welcome. Yes, Father. Yeah, please go ahead. Father, in the last class, uh, we were told that uh, Jesus was not aware that uh, he was God and because he was uh, human. So, and uh, you have said just now that uh, the Father and Son are one. So, was he not aware that uh, uh, he was God? Jesus is growing in this awareness that uh, the humanity of Jesus is created humanity. The uh, humanity of Jesus is created humanity and he grew in the awareness. It doesn't mean that uh, 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 no, yeah, he, is, uh, he is like us. That is a problem with adoptionism. We will talk about it. He is not like any one of us. God son, that's why I said no. The, there is a qualitative relationship. We need to go back to that. The quality, the relationship, the, the way we have with the Father is qualitatively different. So, He is by nature Son of God. That will come later. By nature Son of God and the Jesus in His uh, created humanity continue to grow in that awareness. Thank you. Brinale, you want to ask a question? Please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask this question, uh, Father Edwin. Yeah. This this mutual reciprocity, this mutual knowledge, this mutual love. I mean, this is the takeover takeaway that I have from this uh, part of your session. The mutual interiority and in eminent in, uh, is is also an invitation. I mean, uh, uh, to each one of us to strive for this kind of an intimacy. Can we draw that from, uh, you know, from, from the Trinitarian understanding? Yes. See, that's what I said, um, um, John 20, 17, chapter 17, 21, that this is spread that they may be one even as we are one. So we are the children of God. Of course, you know, um, uh, in, the, in the baptism, uh, we die with Christ, listen with Christ, and uh, uh, we receive... Uh, we are received as children of God in Christ, the power of Christ in the in the power of the Holy in Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we are all connected, united. So as we as the Trinity is one, and we are called to be uh, to to be united with one another. Yeah, it's very beautifully that says, as we are one, and let them be one. Yeah. Uh, Father Rajkumar, this is Maria. This is a question uh, uh, in relation to what uh, Father Victor Edwin was saying. Uh, for me, I do work with uh, you know people from the other denominations a little bit. Uh, I have difficulty. Uh, I mean, this is also my prayer, right? John seventeen twenty one that they may all be one. Uh, I really wish we could all work together uh, to bring the kingdom. But then. Uh, I do find it difficult sometimes to have healthy conversations. So will we have a class that will give us some tips or guidelines as to where we draw the lines um, with our beliefs, not imposing our beliefs at the same time? What are the factors, uh, unifying factors? Yeah, Christ is a unifying factor, but what, 
what are the areas where we can work on positively uh, and what are the areas that we should avoid you know so if you can uh, i don't know if, if you're going to have any class uh, to help us with that that'll be very helpful uh, i think uh, father victor edwin if you want to get touch upon it shortly but we can handle it little later because that okay. would be a different area but okay it's very much connected we could deal with it later but at the same time in case i leave it to father victor edwin i think that's what you suggest would be is it's a long uh, no it, it, it's a more of a discussion uh, than pointed question but that, we can take that up later uh, what what maria asked sorry. maybe a little later we should father yes. edwin there is one more question about uh, the categories that you explained yeah. yeah could you just develop further that is a question there i see it on the chat if you want to explain that and one more question is from brito what's the question the categories i talked about what yeah, about can you explain little more maybe in a brief way tak 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 put that it will be helpful because i talked about a uh, uh, number of things now from reciprocity to uh, how it uh, grows into a mutual interiority so if any specific question would be helpful always explaining is once again now uh, no okay. so yeah. lavina please take care of that and there is one more question if you see it in the chat how god of philosophy yeah. is different from god of abraham isaiah etc that's a question from brito uh this is a good question see um by uh, the trinitarian faith the data is revealed in the uh, in the bible so we have uh, dealt with that how the father reveals god reveals himself as father in the old testament and the son in the new testament and in the pentecost the spirit god who is transcendent god who is with us and god within the community that's the idea now philosophers god is not a different god of all god is one philosophers uh, for an example when they go to the uh, when uh, when the christian faith uh, was um, expanding when they were uh, meeting with the greek people mm. so the greeks expert or express certain questions so they explain the categories that greeks understand so greek philosophy was a tool to explain the faith is not a different altogether greek is a philosophy and the categories of the philosophy are used to explain what the data reveal in the scripture so what the data reveal in the scripture is explained in a different context for some people so the philosophers do that so they, the god is not a different god yes thank you this is a good question and uh, there is one more question on the chat can we say that ultimately the mission of jesus was to reveal to us the heart of the father and draw us into that intimacy he had with his father i think that's beautifully said the mission is to uh, the reveal the heart of the father and uh, the mission uh, the trinitarian mission we are participating in the trinitarian mission yes mission is not uh, my mission or your mission but mission is god's mission and we are uh, we are uh, no joining the lord joining christ in the mission and uh, uh, the mission is to fulfill to to help people to come to the heart of jesus and i read one beautiful sentence from one of um, the a jesuit theologian he says with regard to people of other faith it is not about changing the faith of others but helping people to come to the heart of jesus that is the mission very well said thank you uh heart of jesus uh, the heart of the father how sorry jesus... heart of the father i'm sorry yeah. sorry i just very very how we can ex- Edwin, father victor i have a question uh the categories you said were four second is unity third is immanence fourth is I- identity which is oneness can you uh repeat what is the first one the first one is the, about reciprocity Faith, you, said father, are, you, said, you said these are four dimensions of reciprocity so how can the first dimension of reciprocity first the dimension is reciprocal knowledge and love reciprocal knowledge okay knowledge. thank you thank you reciprocal knowledge you could uh, refer uh, matthew 11 verse 27 luke 
Jen? Yes, I have all of that. Just wanted to another category. Thank you. Father Victor, there is one uh, good question. I think that's from uh, Singapore or Malaysia, Stella Francis. How we can explain the Blessed Trinity in a simple manner to others? Now it's a difficult question. Please answer that. See, um, as I said in the beginning, this is a gift to us. Yeah. And it is best explained not in words, I think, but by deeds. The Lord says that, you know, prays that as we are one, that we are, uh, let there be uh, one, uh, that, uh, sorry, the verse, uh, chapter John, uh, that prayer, living it, that prayer in our life is the way we can uh, uh, explain our faith. We cannot, because it's a gift of faith. Now we understand, we, uh, we profess uh, the faith in uh, Trinitarian God. Doesn't mean that we understand uh, we have we have comprehend God. That is the arrogance of humanity. No, we cannot comprehend God. The mystery revealed to us, where which we make it as a foundation of our life and live life. When we live together as brothers and sisters, without uh, discriminating one against the other in terms of caste, in terms of ethnic uh, differences, as one Christian community, reaching out to others in love, then they will know that uh, what we believe in. But it cannot be explained by what, because it's, it, uh, it, it, uh, it escapes our, um, our uh, intelligence. Oh, that's why I always say, our faith is rational, but it is not, uh, uh, doesn't mean that we can comprehend it. It's beyond our reason. It goes beyond our reason. It is transcending our reason. So we can explain our faith only through our life by living, um, ex sort of um, reflecting the life of Trinity in our family, in our community life. Then we can best, uh, best explain faith to others. Our life should explain. Thank you. Uh, perhaps that's what the, or maybe the last question. There is one more. Uh, you mentioned about Rahem in the beginning, isn't it? That's just a huh? About that word Rahem. Rahim, or Raham, yeah. Yeah. So they want a little explanation on that. Yeah. See, Raham uh, is a Hebrew word. Uh, in Hebrew and Semitic languages, every word comes from a three letter root. It's in Arabic uh, very well, I know that uh, ra ha ma so that is the three letter word that means um rahm is um the mercy when we talk about mercy mercy means it is the um umish love that is to say that uh, mercy is like uh, it's not uh, in the in the mind i'm merciful not in my thinking my mercy means from the bones from the from the depth of our heart, from the stomach, the churning of the stomach. When you see something which is, uh, uh, you, the anger comes or love comes from the depth. So that is Ram. So Ram is the womb love. How the mother loves the child in the womb, yeah. God loves. That's why God says, even if the mother in the womb does, forgets the child, I would not forget. So the deep, deepest form of love, the love, from the depth of human person, from the depth of God. That is Rahim, yeah. Uh, there is, ah, Andrew Pamai. Finally, Andrew, you are speaking out. Very good, welcome. He is asking a question, it's on the chat. Is there a place yeah. where Trinity revealed in Old Testament, like it is revealed in New Testament at baptism of Jesus? Is there any specific place in the Old Testament where Trinity is revealed. Yes. See, the uh, earlier scholars would say about no, uh, the plural form of no, we created. These are part of not Trinitarian expressions. But I think the modern scholars do not give more attention to that. What, so a basic thing we need to um, uh, see is that the Father is revealed brightly. The other dimensions, word, wisdom, spirit, they dimly reveal the inner richness of life that as the, the later in the New Testament, it is revealed as for Son and the Spirit. 
So some of the expressions like you no, know, uh, no, we create. Uh, so the plural form shows that uh, you no, know, uh, the Trinity. Yeah, they are both linguistic, but our attention more on the Father and Son and Spirit. Wonderful. I think, Father Victor, we could continue with your class. Yeah. Yes. So we talked about Father in the New Testament. Father's unique relationship, all those things. Now, we can say the same thing from the point of view of Jesus also. Jesus the Son. So I'm not going into in depth because same thing said from the different angle. That is like, no, five points could be, no, Jesus Christ accomplishes the work of the Father. Jesus is one sent by the Father, which we have already seen. And uh, Son of Man, uh, Daniel, uh, a Son of Man, Jesus uses the term uh, Son of Man, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then Jesus, the object of worship. They worship the risen and crucified and risen Lord, they worship. So we look at from the same, uh, from another perspective. So Son, so we uh, settle with Jesus, Father and Son. Because we need to enter into uh, our third member, who is the uh, agent of salvation, the Holy Spirit. So in the Pentecost, Holy Spirit is revealed in his brightness. Doesn't mean Holy Spirit was not there first time he sent, she is appearing or he is appearing in the horizon. No. Spirit was there from the creation. And here, the father, the son, father, father and son sends the Holy Spirit. So I put this in particular way, this particular way, the transcendent God, Father, the transcendent God reveals himself as Father, Father, and then the second uh, part of the revelation, inner richness is Son, Jesus, the Word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us, God with us, God who is Father, is Father who reveals, and God with us, the word becomes flesh. God with us, Emmanuel. And the third person of the uh, Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit. God within the community, agent of salvation. Here the key word is Holy Spirit as the agent of salvation. We will look at it. The evangel evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of them, they express Holy Spirit as the agents of, sorry, agent of salvation. Just one, one thing I want to communicate to Father, uh, Father um, uh, Raj. Yes, Father Victor. So I should communicate it uh, discreetly. Yeah. Uh, one moment. It's okay. I can say that I get a little distracted. Uh, someone is walking all the time. I get distracted. I'm sorry, my brothers. Ah, okay. Uh, no? uh, okay, good. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, we should not uh, waste time because we have a very short time. Now. The Holy Spirit is an agent, is the agent of salvation. All uh, the, uh, the three, the evangelists, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, talk about Holy Spirit as the agent of salvation. He accomplishes uh, Holy Spirit, no, uh, uh, Salvation is accomplished by Father in Jesus Christ. In that accomplishment, that whole um, salvation history, the Spirit is accompanying. We look at that uh, um, from the beginning. The, we, with our faith, uh, faith affirmation, we say that um, in our in the in the uh, creed, we affirm that Jesus Christ. Conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who is in the, in, the, in the creation is present when uh, the, the word becoming flesh. In the mystery of word becoming flesh, the Spirit is present. Conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the baptism, baptism is very important uh, uh, occasion. So many theologians would develop it as I know that. Uh, important four missiological principles in baptism. That is very important because the Holy Spirit is active. The first uh, missiological, uh, uh, missiological principle is Jesus choosing, discerning what he is going to do. 
Jesus was there, there were several types of spiritualities available. The Sadducees, the Pharisees and Zealots. Jesus discerns and chooses the liberative religiousness of John the Baptist. John the Baptist comes from the deuteronomical tradition, the um, asceticism. It's not a dry asceticism, but a liberative religiousness. Jesus chooses that, the power of the Spirit. Then Jesus goes to the Jordan, and uh, Jordan opting to be baptized. When opting to be baptized, you look at the scene, the leprosy patients, uh, uh, sex workers and marginalized people, sin people, uh, sinners, and uh, uh, those who collect taxes, all sorts of uh, people who are pushed out of the um, uh, society is there. Jesus opting to stand with them. The spirit leads to Jesus there. He identifies with the poor. And Jesus, that's why some theologians would say, Jesus is the defense pact God made on behalf of the poor against the mammon of power and money. So Jesus discerns in the light and the warmth of the spirit getting to be baptized, standing to be baptized, identifying with them. And the third, Jesus is baptized. Here in this baptism, Jesus receives the missionary credentials here he is my son, hear him, the father says. So his missionary credential that one who has to be listened to is revealed there. And in the light and the warmth of the spirit. And finally, Jesus submits himself to this baptism. It is a self-effacing act in the warmth and the spirit of the Holy Spirit. There Jesus loses his identity. By losing his identity, Jesus recognizes his true identity as the Lamb of God, as the, uh, no one um, discovers his identity as merciful face of God in this earth. All happens as in the, in the light and the warmth of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit is part of this salvation history. Then finally, uh, in the, in the, uh, Jesus' uh, second baptism, the baptism of blood on the cross. As I said earlier, the triune God is engaging with uh, the sinless, sinless sins of humanity, the ho utter hopelessness, hopelessness of humanity and de for the deliverance of humanity. So, so whole, all the three persons, Father, Son, and the Spirit working together for the deliverance of humanity. So, Spirit is the agent of salvation of humanity. So Holy Spirit is present. So the Spirit is present in the salvation history and continue to present within the community, forming us in the image of uh, Jesus because we are created in the image and likeness of God and we are oriented towards Jesus in his image, towards his image, and then the restored image, and through, in, uh, through him, and in the power of the Spirit, we are made children of God. So that journey is going on. So the Spirit is animating each one of us, our families, our communities, and our uh, community in the uh, society to move towards this final eschaton, move towards the final kingdom of God. So the Spirit is moving us. God, one God, three you know, persons. One, you know, one uh, integral unit, one integral God, one God, but distinct to persons, Father, Son, and the Spirit. So the Bible gives the data for that. I think we, will, um, we shall stop here for a minute because this is one unit I finished. The second unit will be entering into uh, how this faith is carried. So that's where no, I said as a third part of the, our, uh, our presentation will have how, uh, what are the different struggles came in, uh, in presenting this faith. Shall we stop or shall we continue? Father Raj? Yeah, is there anyone with a question?
I think you can go ahead, Father Victor. Okay. Uh, now, um, this faith, the data, <laughs> the data that we have got from the Bible, uh, in, the, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, in the light and death and resurrection of Jesus, and in the, in the animated spirit of the after the Pentecost, and the you know, first disciples, the apostles, give witness to this faith. And they are witnesses of um, uh, different three, three types we can put. The first uh, type is simply giving Jesus a title. Please uh, um, note down Romans chapter 10 verse 9. Affirming Jesus is the Lord. And 1 John chapter 4 15. Jesus is the son of God. So these are all Faith expressions. The first community expresses his faith. The second type is of a charismatic formulation. It is something like no one example is, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 5, it says, it, it will central aspects are in the life of uh, Jesus Christ is remembered. Jesus Christ Christ died, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, buried and raised uh, and appeared to our apostles. So it is a charismatic form, it's a preaching. So everything in the light of the resurrection of the faith. And the third, third is sort of a two-part uh, two, two formula. For example, Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus is the Lord, the glory of the Father. So these are the different ways in which the first Christian community express their faith in, uh, in, uh, in Jesus. By expressing their faith, they express their faith in the Father and in the Holy Spirit. Now, as, we, uh, uh, as they begin to give witness to their faith, especially when the uh, Christian faith went beyond this Semitic uh, Jewish understanding, when it, uh, when it uh, dealt with the other faiths, especially Greek faith, number of heresies means number of, number of questions that uh, came up and how the Christian theologians, so few things we can see here now. One of the first major problem is adoptionism. Here the adoptionism, the key word is that Jesus is a mere man. It is a you know, very radical uh, um, heresy. See here, the quest, the, the, the faith in the divinity of Christ is being questioned. When faith in the divinity of uh, Jesus is questioned, it destroys our faith in Trinity. Let me explain. The adoption is that um, heresy, the, those who uh, spread that, they said, Jesus is simply a man. And asked, is Jesus son of God? They said, yes, Jesus is son of God. But how? He was adopted. He was born like anyone of us. He um, bent his will completely to the will of God. And uh, as a grace, the word came and dwelt upon him. And he became God. Jesus, sorry, he became son of God. So Jesus is not by nature son of God. Jesus is adopted son of God. Jesus is son of God. Yes, by adoption, not by nature. So here, the divinity of Christ is uh, destroyed. As a result, the faith in Trinity is being questioned and destroyed. So adoptionism is a major crisis that, um, that uh, threatened to destroy the nascent Christian communities, faith in, uh, uh, faith in the you know, eternity. A subtle form of it appeared in the name of uh, monarchianism, Unitarian monarchianism. So it's another form. So there, it's also called as modalism and Sabellianism, depend upon, uh, not by the different scholars, the different uh, writers in the ancient or in the nascent Christian times. There, 
It goes to the other side. It says, Father, Son, and Spirit, yes. But they are not distinct persons. They are not distinct in themselves. They are the same mode. One God comes with different modes. So like, you know, Greek dramas, they say, one person, I put a, a mask in front of me, like a woman, like a man, like a demon, and an act. So I can act many acts. In the same drama, I come as a woman, with the mask of a woman, then I come as a soldier, I come as a king. So I can act in different roles, different roles with the mask. So something similar, they said, it's not you know, distinct persons. One God in different modes, one God in different manifestations. So this uh, destroys the, uh, uh, the Trinitarian faith. So the first theologian, important theologian, who responded to it is um, uh, Tertullian. So he expressed, uh, not, uh, he expressed the, the distinct person, the real otherness of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. He said he has to emphasize the real otherness of Father, Son, and Spirit. They are not different modes. Neither they are for, for Son as a human creature, no. They are one God as distinct person. So distinctly the other. Father is distinctly the other than the Son and the Spirit. Son is distinctly the other than Father and Spirit. So that, in order to emphasize that, he brought the word person. And in the Greek church, they would use the word hypostasis. We don't uh, look at, don't enter into it now. Simply take this word person. He give, brings the word person. Father, son are distinct. They are different person. Uh, the distinct in person but not in their substance. The substance is one, but different in subsistence. Distinctly different, but of the one substance. God is one, the one substance. See, these are all philosophical categories they brought to, to, uh, to engage with uh, uh, those who raised questions on the faith of uh, Trinity. Okay, the next uh, important um, uh, category, the uh, important uh, challenge came from um, a priest, a uh, um, uh, theologian, Arius. He's from Alexandria. He's from Alexandria. He talked about, uh, he, he uh, denied modalism, saying that they are not three different modes, but he fall into the other side of the uh, era. He said, Father and son are not of the same substance because father's substance is unbegotten, unoriginated. Son cannot be of same unbegotten. If a son is from the father, if a son is also unbegotten, then there will be two gods. So that's not possible. Son is not unbegotten. So son is not eternal either. So they are not from the same substance. So son is not eternal. So he was created in time. Yes, he is a sort of a demigod. Through him, God created other, other creatures. Yeah, Jesus is created before time, before humanity was created. But he is of, of not of the same substance. So here, this is once again, destroys the uh, our faith in, uh, in a triune God. And uh, this is being countered by, especially by uh, Saint Athanasius. He, uh, he, he affirms, first of all, the, the, the divine, the Holy Spirit is divine person and who sanctifies and divinizes us. Then he continues to build a, uh, build a, a a defense of the faith. I think you here we can stop and we can have some questions.
otherwise it will continue like this, no one after the other. Maybe better to better to clarify here. Yes. Any questions? Uh, perhaps we can go back to one of the somebody asked one question earlier. Yeah. How can I help other religion friend to understand that one God in three persons? I think that is close to what you just now trying to explain with the help of the crisis. All these. Uh, huh? Yes, one thank God. you. Thank you for the question. See. Um, yeah, we can explain what we have. See, for me, I think, you uh, know, I, I find it difficult to, uh, uh, this question, you know, this faith is not given to uh, people of other faiths. See, once it is not given to other faiths, you cannot, because when I feel that if I think unconsciously, I was also think of that earlier. Unconsciously, if I think that my word can induce faith in the other, then it is sort of an arrogance. This is an earthen treasure we receive this gift. And we live it out. And of course, we can share our faith. We can give witness to our faith. But in a polemical uh, teaching level, helping them to understand and uh, become Christian, that is uh, not uh, the right approach. Oftentimes, because why I'm saying I'm resisting this question in a way is that quite often I'm asked, since I'm working with people of other faiths, I'm often asked, I need to explain to the faith so that the other can understand my faith and accept it. I think that is uh, not uh, the, the faith. Uh, that, that's not the way to uh, respond. That's why I said, I emphasize that we live it in our, uh, our life. Then it will, uh, it will, attract the other and to know about us and there uh, no, uh, the God may open uh, open their mind a heart to receive this gift so I continue to resist this question I can we can explain it this is what we believe in we believe in but we should be very careful that we should that we should never think that uh, my word will induce faith in the other yeah Thank father you. Uh... Victor, yes. I mean, I uh, am Brunel again, and I've also been involved in a lot of inter-religious dialogue and work. And you know, as a social work educator myself, you know, involved with various movements and activism, I feel that you know, I mean, we are called uh, to help people experience God through our lives, and not through any theological concepts. Because once people experience God through our lives, or you know. That, that will help them to reach into deeper intimacy and their own expression of their own faith or whatever. So even, so, so this is my, my submission or how I have tried to work so that God experience is the God experience which is important than any kind of a theological understanding. That is something which may or may not arrive. See, this is, I would say yes and no. See, as I said in the beginning, I said, no, uh, we need to uh, really deeply understand it. You cannot simply dismiss it as a um, as, uh, mystery, as I said. It becomes the foundation, wellspring for our life. And then even somebody, uh, it's not the Lord touches their, their heart and they want to, um, you know, the seeking fellowship in the Christian community, then we need to help them. This is how the scripture helps. This is how the scripture is revealed. Yeah. That's uh, both are important. Both are important. Yes. Yeah. Father, this is Maria Kavita. I like the way you explained it, and I tend to agree with uh, Brunel also. Uh, um, but uh, my difficulty, the area of difficulty is uh, when I'm in dialogue with uh, people, uh, Christians. Uh, non-Catholics, right? That's where I have trouble because they are. Uh, they also believe that they are baptized. They also believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, but somewhere I find that there is a disconnect. So how do we bring that connect? How do we, uh, I mean, we, it, they don't see from our lives, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because they, they also believe they're also living this, I mean, living a life that 
that uh, Jesus called them to live, right? The one uh, single way, the one single truth and so on. So it's, I find it very hard uh, only with people of other denominations, not of other religions. You see what I'm saying? I think in this, uh, in this um, uh, realm of uh, uh, understanding God as a uh, uh, Trinitarian God, uh, I think uh, with um, uh, in the ecumenism, uh, we do not have a difficult, except one with regard to Holy Spirit. The ecumenical, you know, the, um, the Eastern uh, Church would uh, say the, the Spirit comes from the Father for the philoki, philoki uh, controversy. We would have our faith uh, expression creed is well, the Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. and the same father, the, the spirit comes from the father. So original expression, later it was changed father and the son. So the, these type of differences are there. Hmm. Otherwise, in general, uh, recognizing father, son, and the spirit uh, with uh, ecumenical relationship, uh, we do not have any uh, difficulty. But of course, yes, with the um, number of the new Pentecostal type of groups, uh, they do not have any uh, a solid theology. The Pentecostals have a solid theology. Uh, the emphasis on the sola scriptura, the uh, faith, the scripture, uh, putting the faith on the scripture. Mm. Uh, they have a solid theology, but, but Lutherans, the churches among themselves, they have uh, you know, a Trinitarian theology. Famous right. Karl Barth, Barth, many others are very, very good, important uh, theologians. Uh, but with the, the, some of the Pentecostal group, they don't have the theology really, solid theology. They simply, uh, so they may uh, differ. For them, if they are open, we can explain to them. We need to explain to them, if they want. Yeah. It's more of, if one is willing to listen, we say that. But not as a, uh, with, uh, with the force that I induce. I mm. this is right. Thank you. Uh, Father Victor Irvin, there is one more question from uh, Piyush Jha. He says, uh, Father, you said Jesus is not eternal as Father. But if we say Trinity is one, then surely Jesus too is old as the Father. I, I think Jesus is also the same age. That's what he's trying to say. If we say Trinity is one. So how do you respond? <laughs> I didn't say this. Karas uh, said, Ah, it's not you. No, it, that is the Arius heresy. Yeah. Arius said that Jesus is co, not co-eternal because if you say that Jesus is co-eternal, he should be also unbegotten substance. But he cannot have two unbegotten substance. So Jesus is begotten. So it must be uh, in time. So it is, he is not co-eternal. That is the heresy I, I said. Uh, it's not that, um, that, that's not the Christian. Oh, Hope I, I explained it. Yes, yes, correct. Anybody else? Yeah, Father. Father, could I ask one question? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, you know, like uh, as a Catholic, we are brought up in the faith uh, of the Trinity and so on. But uh, And all three persons we believe in. But, you know, we are more used to and uh, we feel more familiar with Jesus. Means one person more than the other two persons. Is that okay or we have to be impartial and like all the, I mean, love all the three people equally? That's very good. See, uh, your question your is very important because uh, this question even uh, troubled the uh, great theologian Karl Rana. Karl Rana said... We are so, in a way, we are uh, monophysites. Uh, we are so attached to Jesus. Yes, that's true. Because Jesus, we can, he was, he's a human and divine, the two natures. No? We can speak to Jesus because he can understand. He was uh, he born as a human. Mm. And uh, so we feel the intimacy with him and uh, we feel uh, the communion with him and uh, through the sacraments we feel communion. It's all this. But uh, we need to recognize richness. We should not uh, lose the richness of what God is doing for us. Um, uh, uh, no, unfolding this one, uh, unfolding of God in Father, and Spirit, Son, and the Spirit. Our intimacy with Jesus is uh, naturally it will lead us to be the child of God, sharing divine life with us. That's what happened in our baptism. In baptism, we died with Christ, we sinned with Christ, in Christ, through the Spirit, through the power of the Spirit, 
we have become the children of God. So connection with God, the communion with Christ is eventually makes us to remember what happened in our baptism and what is going to happen in the eschaton. We are children of God. We are children of this father. Father is sharing divine life with us. So Jesus is not blocking us, rather facilitating us as the son of the father, facilitating us through him in the power of the spirit to become children of God. Thank you. Good. Go ahead. Any other questions? Can I just uh, clarify one thing that, I mean, okay, we are supposed to have the, you know, same good relation with the father and the uh, spirit. But somehow, you know, I mean, even visualizing, like you can think of Jesus as a human being and talk to him, as you said. But um, I mean, for me, the spirit always appears like a dove. I mean, you know, somehow. Uh, so relating to the spirit becomes difficult. So what does one do in this? Is my faith to be questioned or what do I do? The spirit is within you. Uh, Ma'am, when you pray, what St. Paul says, the spirit within you prays up our father. It's already given. Something which is an extrinsic reality. It is within praying Abba Father. We don't pray. The Spirit prays within Abba, within us, Abba Father. The Spirit is uh, the salvation, as we said, no, the salvation, the agent of salvation in the human history. The Spirit praying within us. Okay. So the Spirit is, see, each member of this Holy Trinity, they would say, you know, and philosophically, are the extra. That means outside the Trinity work together as one unit. That's what he said, uh, so according to St. Paul, Paul, in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, it's not simply Jesus is um, uh, you know, suffering. The whole, uh, so Jesus is engaging with the utter hopelessness and the sinfulness of humanity. The whole Trinity, Father and the Son and the Spirit, together engaging with uh, the utter hopelessness of humanity for the deliverance of humanity. So, at the extra, they would say, you no know, philosophers, philosophers, theologians would say, at the extra, outside the Trinity, they work as one unit. So, so our uh, experiencing the spirit from within is not uh, blocking us from uh, communicating or being in communion with us. The spirit leads us to our, our Jesus. As the, the, the Lord leads us to our Father. Any that's why St. Paul said, any spirit that does not lead us to Jesus is not the spirit of the Father. Hmm? Yeah. So it's not one against the other, all together. Yes. Good. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Yeah. Father, can I ask a question? Yes, Hello? there was someone yes. who... Yeah, yeah. Father, my, my question is, uh, so should we pray to Jesus or to the Holy Spirit? So once again, he said... Uh, we are praying to Jesus. Yes, as human beings, we pray to Jesus. At the same time, I said, what to praise is within ourselves is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit prays above Father. It is not that we, uh, uh, we are uh, unhappy with the Holy Spirit, so we pray to Jesus. <laughs> no. When we are sp praying, our prayer puts us in touch with the Holy Trinity. That's why every prayer is begin with the Father, Son, and the Spirit, Holy Spirit. And in the, in the Eucharist, uh, uh, no, we, all the prayers are addressed to the Father through the, in, in, in Christ and through the power of the Spirit. So prayer, we don't distinguish uh, no, um, the Spirit. We, I'm, at, I'm attached to Christ and I'm not worried about Father and the Spirit, no. We, we pray to our prayer puts us in touch to attach with this richness of our Trinity. Yes, Jesus, we pray to him because, uh, no, as they said, he became human person and he lived like us. Except sin, he went through all the sufferings and temptations. So we even go through sufferings and temptations so we can, no, Jesus can feel with us. In that sense, we pray to him. Doesn't mean that it puts us away from the Spirit and the Okay, thank you, Father. Uh, good, Father. Now I think we could go ahead with the last phase of your talk. Maybe you can take another five, six, seven minutes, and then we'll come back to the final questions. Uh, 
But I think, see, um, the, uh, if we go much more, no more of uh, philosophical things, we may not be able to uh, okay. so get then... during the five, six minutes. So I would suggest that in case um, uh, more questions come, then we can. Uh, okay. Because it's uh, already 6.42. Okay, good. Elodie, you had mentioned I'll ask. someone asked me a question. Father? Yes, please go ahead. I am Meena here. Yeah. In, pre in present scenario, being a rigid Christian is better or being a flexible one? <laughs> rigid Christian and flexible. Let's be the, in the mold of the Holy Trinity. Uh, let's make the, the Trinitarian faith as the foundation of our life. See, how we express our faith in relationship, in reconciliation, in forgiveness. Mm -hmm. See, let us uh, no, no, ask for the grace to live life of reconciliation, life of forgiveness, uh, life of blessing, uh, patience, first growth in patience and prayer and perseverance. So that life, if you call it is a flexible Christian life or rigid Christian, labels do, do not matter but how we live our life. If my word and deed brings people together, or I am a divisive force in a community. If my word and deed is a blessing for other, or it brings uh, you know, the difficulties in the life of the other. So prayer, for me, these three words are very important. Prayer, perseverance, and patience. And that leads us to be uh, 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 no, um, messengers of peace and um, uh, maker of peace, a peace agent in this world. So you put this a label, <laughs> a label uh, liberative Christian, whatever label, a humble label would be good. Thank you. Uh, perhaps if I add one more thing along with Father Victor Edwin, as he talked about how the mutual indwelling, etc. Uh, perhaps in our lives, we can also reflect the same communion as we see in the Trinity. And thereby you relate to all the three and the Trinity reveals that communion dimension. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Gloria has a question. Hello. Maybe good to take another heresy on the Trinity and give the counter explanation. Okay. Okay. Yes. So we shall kind of <laughs> maybe we have to deal with our Ionimus. Very difficult to follow. He has to be dealt with. That's the next one after Arius. See, Arius said that um, uh, uh, God is one, it's unbegotten and eternal. Sun cannot be. Uh, uh, unbegotten, he is only begotten, so it cannot be co-eternal. So Son is a, um, a, you know, it's, it's God, it's a demigod, so he uh, is created in time, so he cannot be uh, no co-eternal, co, uh, one of the co, uh, no, one of the three persons of God. So um, in the Council of Nicaea. They, they have um, the, the bishops and uh, the, the council that gathered. They demolished his argument and said, God, true God, and you know, Jesus is true God and true man. So they rejects the um, uh, teachings of Arius and emphasizes that uh, uh, Jesus is true God, human co-eternal. So co uh, one substance, consubstantial. So that's the that's the idea comes there. Then um, uh, one important uh, person called Ionimus, very difficult to pronounce his uh, name. See, he uh, <laughs> puts a. It's a long. Actually, it's a little longer. I'm ready to go for more time. Fine. So it's unbegotten means he explains it as ingenerate. Positively, the very substance of God. So when you put Jesus as 
begotten. So it is not ingenerate. It was generated. So it is a different substance altogether. That is his argument. So he is, uh, explain, he is elaborating what Arius said. Arius simply said it is unbegotten. He is begotten, so it cannot be said. He explains it a little more deeply with the philosophical. If you say unbegotten, it is ingenerate. That's uh, another philosophical term. If you call it as uh, ingenerate, then Jesus begotten is not ingenerate. He was generated because son is generated from the father. So by substance, they cannot be of the same substance. So that is being uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, encountered very specially by the Cappadocian father, Basil. Basil is engaging with this uh, controversy. Unimus, Unimus, you say that he is ingenerate and so it is unbegotten. So Jesus is generate, he cannot be a saint. So he is entering into that uh, uh, philosophical. Here the speculative theology comes to play. Take a name, he says, any name. There could be two types of name. So the first category is what things are. For example, a horse, an elephant. So this is a name. It's uh, the one category of names. The other category talks about not of this uh, about a horse, or something which is not there. For example, empty classroom. Empty classroom is not the substance of the classroom. The second year theology classroom is empty. Doesn't mean second year classroom is empty classroom. No. Second year classroom, at the moment, there are no students, so empty. So you see the difference between the names. One name expresses what things are. The other name expresses what things are not. So Basil says this unbegotten belongs to the second category. It does not signify the substance of God. It does not signify the substance of God. It simply states father is unbegotten. The son is begotten. So here, the importance is the relations. So he goes to the second explanation. So the second explanation is that um, um, the first category, you take once again name, the first category of the name explains the, the terms in themselves for like, you know, man. I am a man for Rajkumar man and uh, somebody is a woman. So it explains the name. The second category, yes, Father? Yeah, and when you finish, then there are one or two more questions they are waiting. Yeah, okay. So the second is the relations. I am a friend of uh, Father Rajkumar. Friend is a name. It is not saying about uh, he or she. It is the relationship. So the names are not only identifying things, identifying the nature, but also identify the relationship. He is my friend. So the relationship. So this uh, father son is not like a mother father, but identifies with the relationship of father and son. So the same substance can have the same substance is revealed as three relationships, father, son, and the love between this father and the son is Holy Spirit. So this is how the speculative theology develops to engage with uh, the philosophical terms. Yes. Good Father Victor. I think it is connected to that. There is a question from Majori Fernandez uh, saying, I'm not clear about all three persons of God being present in the Eucharist. Very good question. After all, Jesus said, this is my body. It's clearly his body and not all three persons in God. So therefore in Eucharist, only Jesus. That's the argument. Thank you. I will just quickly respond and uh, Father uh, Raj, as, uh, you can also kindly uh, add to it. See, dear friends, you know, Eucharist. Yes. What is Eucharist? We are remembering the salvation history. 
The first key word in the Eucharist is anamnesis, remembrance. What we remember? We remember the salvation history. And final uh, event on the Calvary. We are not repeating it. The event is once and for all. And we community make ourselves to present to that one event that happened in, the, in Calvary. In Calvary also he said, Father, Son and the Spirit are engaging with the utter sinfulness of world for the deliverance of human person. So we remember our salvation history, very specially the Calvary. And second aspect is, and not only just remember, and as a remembrance, we also appropriate that. We commune with that, we, we, we enter into that mystery, we appropriate it. And the second key word is epiclesis, invocation. We invoke the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not absent. We invoke the Holy Spirit so that the bread and the wine becomes the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we not only invoke the Holy Spirit to change the transform the bread and wine, but also we invoke that we are transformed into that Trinitarian life. We, we pray that we are transformed into this life. So that's what's happening in the Eucharist. Yes, our devotion to you know, Eucharist is focused on Christ, but it, the theology did not blur it out, this uh, salvation history and invocation of the Holy Spirit and the sin salvation history, the Calvary even, and uh, transforming ourselves into the life of Christ. Yeah. Good. Uh, I may add with that, well, as you explained, Father, so nicely, uh, Eucharist, as Father said, it's a memorial of that particular salvific event. And what is happening is in the Eucharist, Jesus is offering the entire humanity with him to the Father. So therefore, it is a movement mm, yeah. towards the Father. Right. And this movement is sanctified, made present by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So that's why in the doxology, once again, it is aimed to Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Eucharist is an absolute beautiful example of the Trinitarian community or how Trinity works one hand in hand with one another and moving towards. So wonderful. Thanks for that question. And I also want to uh, read Thank out you, one of our um, uh, friends, Saiba George, uh, has brought out uh, St. Ephraim's quote. That's a nice one that it says in the quote on the chat, you can read yourself, all of you. If my mind, I... I have ever magnified the father more than the son. May I be deprived of his loving mercy. <laughs> and if I have ever lessened the authority of the Holy Spirit, may blindness come upon me. Thus, I think the Trinity should be equally worshipped. Is this right? Isn't it? Maybe if I understand, if I see it, Father Victor, please. Since I didn't see the question, uh, what would I respond to it? Because yeah. I didn't see the question. It's a long question. I yeah, couldn't. Yeah, right. see, what we see is the first part of this quote. St. Ephraim is one of the church fathers in the earlier ones. Very good. We, with all due respect, we take that. But the second part of it, of the every point, like if my mind ever magnified the father more than the son, then I may I be deprived of his loving mercy. So that deprived of his loving mercy may go against the original uh, source of God as a uh, unconditional loving father. So therefore, the, but the first point and the first point of every time, the every set is uh, raising that they are equal is very true. All three need to be revered and worshipped equally. That is true. But the punishment that is being attributed goes with the earlier understanding. But today we would see God in a very more merciful way. Am I right, Father? You should not see God very much in the human mode. Uh, we are friends and somebody loves one, they are better than the other. So jealous, Father, Son and the Spirit they are not jealous of. <laughs> and therefore we also worship in equal, correct? Yes, you are right. Thank you, Father. Wonderful. Then anybody else? Uh, Leslie has something. Apostle Creed is not clear as the Nicene Creed, the Father and the Son connection. Can we? This is very good. Um, 
can we discuss and i believe in the holy ghost the lord and giver of life who proceeds from the father okay the starting point is clear the apostle creed is not clear as an icn creed with regard to the father son connection what do we say when when is not clear uh yeah leslie would you like to expand a little more on that where you are not clear uh, yes good evening father so good evening you know in the i mean in a, not from from a literal reading perspective yeah uh, you know when you say uh, when you read the nisin the nisin creed mm-hmm. it's very clearly mentions here uh, you know and i believe in the holy ghost the lord the giver of life who proceeds from the father and the son who with the father and the son together is worship and glorify and who spoke with the who spoke by the prophets whilst when we when we say the apostles creed the mention of the tra, you know the connection between the father and son is not does not come out and uh, i mean from the state just when you read it so i i was just trying to understand the next question also is uh, in the sunday mass today uh, we used to at one point in time do a lot of the nation creed however i think that seems to have dwindled down now why the shift and uh, whilst we were all brought up with the apostles creed <laughs> um shall i go ahead i think uh, yes yes yeah nicene creed came the first response nicene creed is the first response so therefore it has a very elaborative response because they just bring out from the council but when it comes to apostles creed it is a little refined shorter version that is why also if you look at delhi diocese uh, all the parishes are encouraged or rather recommended to use the nicene creed on sunday eucharist uh, so therefore nicene creed has got a elaborative explanation that's true apostle creed is a little shorter uh, and as you rightly put it is more popular yes please. one point is uh, nicene creed has many uh, philosophical terms mm. whereas uh, apostle creed is uh, much more uh, language that ordinary uh, we as we we can easily understand and speak yeah uh, and for the first part of the question uh, yes. whilst uh, you mentioned you know the lord the giver of life who sees from the father and the son uh, can you elaborate a little more on that because in the apostles creed it says and jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary so lord that is that i think you have the book in your hand that's why you are able to make you are able to make the clear statements but um, uh lord giver of life who proceeds from the father and the son okay that's a question from you yes okay that's clear what's the difference what's the yeah. problem huh yeah lesley hello father yeah. yes so i'm wanting to understand the uh, part of the when you mention or you when the when the you know the nation creed mentions uh, the lord the giver of life proceeds from the father and the son mm. the language uh, literally means what father was just mentioning a couple of about half an hour back the connection between the father and the son and the intimacy i mean in the earlier part of the conversation uh, uh, you know lecture you were mentioning about the uh, the intimacy between the father and the son so i was trying to understand um, or maybe uh, i need a little clarification is uh, his only son and the law when the apostles created it, it doesn't come out as the you know the connection which is so strong as mentioned the nation creed i mean that's my understanding maybe i'm wrong maybe if you can just guide me through that okay, one thing we can say thank you thank you for this very very important to ask you know clarify this question the as i said um, the we say that um, uh, the spirit of our, for, the spirit comes from the father and the son 
the Eastern churches use the word for the spirit comes from the Father. This is a whole, whole filioque controversy. That's a long thing to go now. So now what can we say is, see the intimate Father, the love, as St. Augustine says, the love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. So we, in no way we uh, lose any, uh, any of the essence of our faith in, uh, in the creed when we express, uh, express it. See, it is easy, for, um, uh, easy to accept Jesus as human because we, he born and the difficult for, the, the, for those who have brought controversies are about the divinity of Christ. Similarly, the divinity of Holy Spirit is easy to accept because the Spirit was there from the creation beginning. The difficulty is to frame it as a person. That's the difficulty. So the, the Son and the Spirit raises difficulties at two different levels. But our faith element, faith affirmation is Unmute. the faith affirmation is that these three persons of same substance, consubstantial, and they are distinct in their relationships. The Father generates the Son, and the Holy Spirit is spirated. Spiration, the technical word they will use is spiration. So Father, see, Father generates the Son. See, the, of the same um, uh, species generates its own species. A man and woman will give birth to a uh, human child, not um, um, an elephant or a, uh, another animal. The, 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 the species generates the son, father's nature, son. And for spirit is spirated. It's another procession called spiration. So they are philosophical terms. Yeah. Uh, father, Victor, Victor, can you please uh, uh, spell out that term, uh, that aspiration? How, how do you spell it? Spiration. Spiration. Spiration, yes. P I R A T I O N. Spiration. So I, I just want to, if I can ask a question, because, you know, I, I mean, God is spirit, and I understand the Father and the Son, and I also understand the Holy Spirit as an expression of God's love between the Father and the Son. But I've always had this intellectual kind of a, you know, blocky. What was the, what was the, what is the need of the Spirit? Holy Spirit, when God is anyway spirit, you know, from, this is more like an intellectual, uh, at an intellectual level, a block, a, a block, you know, so, mm -hmm. so that is what, because God is spirit, and we know that God is there in, in all of us and, and resides in each of one of us and in creation and everything. So, and, you know, uh, Jesus was begotten of the father, even that is, that is, clear and his, his purpose. I just always sometimes have this intellectual doubt. Then what is, and though I understand the spirit being an expression of love between the father and the son, I say, you know, when God is already spirit, why the Holy Spirit additionally? Yeah. See, um, uh, the human, the Christian, see, um, God, Ultimately, God is one. Ultimately, God is the Spirit. Yes, hmm. but uh, the 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 data is no Father. God reveals Himself. A Father, God who is transcendent. For the Jewish scriptures, that God is who is transcendent. God who reveals God's self as Father. And this uh, Father is not a single entity like no uh, isolated lone, but this. Uh, Dimension now, the mercy dimension, love dimension that he expresses is also within the God's inner life itself. The inner life is rich in love, okay? generating the sun and sending the spirit. Generating the sun, the word becomes, becomes flesh amongst us, Jesus, the word of God who became flesh. And the spirit is sent from the father and the son is what received in the, in the uh, Pentecost. Uh, the disciples and apostles, our lady, all, they received the spirit. And they received the spirit and they were able to uh, proclaim the good news, uh, show the way to the kingdom of God. So it is uh, not the 
uh, two spirits, Father also, no, God is spirit and Holy Spirit is spirit. It's a distinct person who is revealed in the Pentecost time. Wonderful. I think we have heard from everyone and uh, Father Victor Edwin, Father Victor Edwin also is a very good friend of mine. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, talk or explanation because Trinity is usually a theme that is not properly understood by most of us. It remains as a kind of a thing that is outside and today you have taken a lot of effort to explain to us from the historical point of view, also from the biblical perspective, and finally gave us enough time for uh, to also enter into some discussion with you. Thank you so much, and we wish you all the best in your future ministry and whatever you are doing. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father. And uh, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father for thank you very That's much. Good. 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 Thanks for your thank questions. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thanks for your thank questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The final thank you. Just think them up very clearly. Good, I think they are, they are not there anyway. Say a word of thanks to God for the wonderful time. And uh, God continues to bless us. And I wish you all a wonderful, pleasant evening further. And see you all next Sunday. Same time, five o'clock. Dr. Daisy, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank